Hello Retro Air lovers, and welcome to part 1 of my retro build of a Pentium Slot 1 system. In this video I will be exploring the hardware that I will be using for this build. The idea behind the project is to frame this lovely old system into a modern case, complemented by some RGB fans to really set it off. I'm using a brand new Thermaltake View 22 tempered glass edition case that has a nice glass window so that we can see that beautiful retro ware that is housed inside. The front of the case has tinted black pair specs which shows off the Game Eclipse Max RGB fans mounted at the front. The power supply I'll be using is a brand new Thermaltake Light Power 450W PSU as I didn't feel comfortable using an aging PSU for this rig. I've never owned a Pentium Slot 1 system so this will be the first rig that I have built using this hardware. My first ever rig I built as a teenager used the Jetway J542C motherboard which is a Super Socket 7 board and had an AMD K62450 installed. When the time came to upgrade, the next build I chose used an AMD Duron 900 which is a Socket A CPU so I totally skipped out on the Slot 1 systems. The motherboard for this build we're going to use is this lovely Ebit AB BX6 motherboard. It's got a lovely, lovely gold PCB. And I was lucky and fortunate enough to also get the, the user manual for the motherboard as well, which gives us all the details we need and it's in reasonably good condition. An introduction of BX6 feature. This motherboard is designed for the new generation CPU. It supports the Intel Slot 1 Pentium 2 up to 512 megabytes of memory, super I.O. and a green PC function. The main board provides high performance of the server system and meets the requirements of the desktop system for multimedia in the future. So we've got CPU soft menu 2 which will eliminate the need for any jumpers or dip switches needed to set the CPU parameters. You can see there is literally zero in terms of jumps. And switches, there's none at all. Employ switching type regulators to stabilize CPU operation. It supports 66 and 100 megahertz CPU external clock speed. It supports Pentium 2 350 and 400 megahertz processor cartridges based on a 100 megahertz front side bus. And Pentium 2 233 to 333 megahertz processor cartridges based on a 66 megahertz bus. And finally, it also supports Intel Celeron 266 MHz processor cartridges based on a 66 MHz bus also. We're running an Intel 440BX chipset, which supports Ultra DMA33 ID protocol. It supports an advanced configuration and power management interface, ECPI also commonly known as. Accelerated graphics port connector, which supports AGP1 and 2 mode. We've got a level 1 and level 2 cache built into the Intel Pentium 2 processor package. And memory is for 168 pin DIMM SD-RAM modules. It supports up to a total memory of 512 megs. And it also supports ECC memory, which is quite nice. We've got an award bias. It supports plug and play. It supports advanced configuration power interface, ACPI. It supports desktop management interface. And year 2000 compliance, which is quite funny because uh, there was all that concern about the Millennium bug and every computer in the world crashing. So that's enough information from our user manual. In terms of our chipset, as I said it's an Intel 440BX chipset. It was introduced in April 1998 to both 66 and 100 MHz front side bus. It is stated that some motherboards support overclocking to 133 MHz which I haven't tried yet, but I would like to at some point. That also allows usage of some Socket 370 CPUs and uh, using the Slocket, which is the um, Slot 1 to PG 370 converter, which obviously enables this on the board to take Socket 370 CPUs. P2 mode with a max memory mapping of 32 or 64 meg. SD RAM, PC 66 on 100 and 133 if it's overclocked. With up to 4 DIMMs of 256 meg. 
so technically we can install one gig of RAM in here. Three 16-bit ISO sockets, four PCI and one AGP. Got USB, two PS2, four LPT ports, parallel ports, and two serial ports underneath that. Our four SD RAM sockets, two integrated ID controllers, one integrated floppy disk controller, and that's about it. All we need to know. We have our standard 20 pin ATX connector on this board, and as you can see, it's in quite decent condition. We don't have any bolts and caps or anything or anything to really worry about. They all look in quite good condition. So onto the CPU. The CPU is the most interesting part of the whole project really in my opinion. Um, it's a P2400 um, with a 100MHz FSB and a 64-bit data bus. It's got a 16KB level 1 cache and a 512KB level 2 cache running at half the speed of the processor frequency, which in our case is 200MHz. The P2 processor was introduced on the 15th of April 1998, priced at around $824, which is an obscene amount of money for a CPU. The Pentium 2 and Pentium 3 processors are 242 pin single edge contact cartridges named SC242. To prevent the cartridge from being inserted the wrong way, the slot was keyed to allow installation in only one direction. The SC242 was later used for AMD's slot A as well. And while the, slot, the two slots were identical mechanically, they were electrically in incompatible. So to discourage slot A users from trying to install a slot 1 CPU, the connector was rotated 180 degrees on the slot A motherboards. The CPU itself is housed in a plastic and metal case. The back of the housing is plastic and has several markings on it. Obviously, the name Pentium 2 processor, the Intel logo is a hologram. And also we have the model numbers also which are located on the top of the cartridge itself. Under the CPU consists of a black anodized aluminium plate, which in our case is a, a, a heatsink, but on other Pentium CPUs it would have housed the CPU cooler to keep the CPU nice and cool. And there would be a plate that goes through onto the other side. Let me just see if I can get another Pentium CPU to show you. So for just for viewing purposes, this is a Pentium also this is also a Pentium 2. Also a Pentium 2 400, yeah. Pentium 2 400, this one has a fan located on the back, which can be removed by lifting this. And then the entire thing can be removed so you can access the heat sink. But we don't want to do that because I already have one with no bracket on the back so I can actually this one is a, a P3450 this one. and this is what it looks like underneath so this one here. so what we have here is the GPU is here and then we have our two cache modules here, which I'm assuming each one will be 256 kilobytes, making up our 512 meg. Uh, sorry, our 512 kilobytes level two cache. <laughs> and the other 16 kilobytes is built into the die itself, the level one cache. And that is what it looks like underneath. Chip on the other side, and what that does. That must be the cache controller. It talks, the TV talks to that, stops to that, 
Oh, der var en gin. Så igen, basically. That is a Pentium 3. 450 megahertz, when it's completely disassembled. Moving on from our CPU. We're going to be using 256 megabytes of PC133 actually. Um, two 120 meg sticks, they're not from the same company. We've got a Hynix DIM and this other one is a Winbond DIM. But they're both double sided and I've tested them and they both work and they seem to work great together so we'll use 256 meg which is 10 times what I had when I was a teenager growing up. I was running on 24 megs of RAM. A video sims. Um, I can't remember whether I upgraded actually to maybe 128 megs when I had the K62450, but prior to that, for many many years, we were running on 24 megs of RAM, and mm, it was an acceptable amount, I suppose, at the time. With a display, we're going to be using a GeForce 2, an Asus GeForce 2, an Asus GeForce 2 MX200 AGP. Which is only two times AGP. Uh, sorry, cards four times AGP, but the board is only two times AGP, so we're going to be running it two times. Um, it's got 32 megs of RAM on board, um, and it's a lovely gold PCB as well, which matches our motherboard, which is quite nice. It supports OpenGL, DirectX, Direct Draw, and Direct 3D. The RAM back is 350 megahertz and. 32 megs at best, the video memory has an effective clock speed of 166 megahertz. It's also a VGA, nothing special on this card, no TV out or anything like that. Right, so for sound, we're going to be using this ISA Creative Lab Sound Blaster 16 value, the CT2770. Uh, unfortunately, it's the only card that is not gold that's going to match the rest of the system. Um, I may well swap this out at a later date for something that is gold, whether it's all gold and all matches together. Like The card has a Creative Labs or Panasonic IDE CD drive connector. The majority of Sound Blaster 16 cards feature either a discrete Yamaha YMF262 UPL3 FM synthesizer or a Creative CT1747 chip which has this synthesizer integrated, which is what we have here on this one, which I'm not sure we've ever seen. But, yep, there's one there. OPL and also says DT1747. So that is our sound card, which is a lovely, lovely card, even though it's the wrong color to match the rest of our system, but it's still a really nice, we got some nice sounds out of that for DOS games especially anyway. In reality, I did want something a bit like this, which is an Asus Zona DG um, PCI version. It also comes in PCI Express version. I wanted it for the front panel audio connector, which we don't have anywhere on this board because of obviously the age of it. It wasn't around back in 1998. And I don't know of any other um, PCI sound cards that have a front panel audio connector on it. So if if anyone knows of any cards that are Windows 98 compatible, because this one isn't, and there's no the the alias drivers for Win for Win XP. The only way around that is to instead of using Windows 98 on this machine is to upgrade to Windows XP. But unfortunately, yeah, I'm not going to be able to use this because although it is PCI, it doesn't have any drivers for Windows 98. So therefore it's kind of useless in this build but I am gutted because it would look really nice with the black and gold not to be so sadly the front audio connector is going to be the only part of the case to be able to adapt so there's just simply no adder as I said before for the front panel audio 
I've also got a PCI USB 2 on Firewire card. Uh, we've got four extra USB connections on here and one Firewire. Uh, it's running a Fire PT6212L chipset, which is right here. There's not really very much to this card, but it gives us a USB 2 capability on this board. This is a nice little upgrade from what we're using at the moment, which will be USB 1 or 1.1. Also, I can use this particular card, and with it being gold as well, which nicely matches our current power setup. We've got internal USB, which this cable can then connect to, and we can connect our front USB using this cable. And this cable was quite expensive for it, as I think it was about 6 or 7 pounds. Quite a dear cable, but that's our USB sorted. And uh, last but not least is just storage now, which is we're going to be using a Seagate, a 10 gigabyte Seagate um, Xbox hard drive, repurposing that for this build with the model number ST31004 ACE. So it's an ACE drive. So yeah, that's our boot drive for our operating system. And as secondary storage, we're going to be using this compact flash card, which was was in a PCI bay. Sorry, in, in a, one of the card bays. But I just took the brackets off and used these little plastic clips here to just fasten it. Nicely to the simple little plastic clips, but they hold it on nicely. It's just so that we don't have to have it in the PCI bay and this cable trail into the controller. We can tuck it out the way behind the panel, the cable tidy panel in the case. So I'm, I'm hoping, yeah, this will be a really tidy build when it's complete because there won't be really much in terms of cable and wires. And this is our last card we're using, which is a SanDisk Extreme. A SanDisk Extreme 64GB and it will do 120 megaseconds. so arguably it could well be faster than our IDE drive. And that is that. That is everything that we're going to be using in this build. If you got this far, thanks very much for watching all the way to the end. And join me in part 2, where we'll assemble this all into its case, and we'll fire it up, and we'll get some games going on it. Take care everyone.